Hi, and welcome to this presentation of STRAX. My name is Hugo Lisha, and I work as an equity research analyst here at Eric Penzer Bank. With me from STRAX, I have the CEO, Gudmundur Palmason. A warm welcome, Gudmundur. The floor is yours. Thank you, Hugo, and, and thank you, Penzer, for <clears throat> allowing me to present uh, STRAX once and again. And, and I think it's critically important now to communicate on a regular basis, given a, the performance last year, and B, in numerous transactions, we are continuously working now to improve the situation going forward. Uh, so first of all, I just want to <clears throat> briefly run through the 2022 results, which by all measures were extremely disappointing. And we sort of, we entered 2022 with good momentum from uh, sort of the back end of uh, especially Q4 in, in 2021, and, and we were hopeful that the markets would stabilize, normalize, uh, sort of back to pre-COVID levels. Uh, and, and so the year started off well, but unfortunately <clears throat> we had the incident in, in Ukraine and, and with the war outbreak uh, between Russia and Ukraine severely impacting the overall sentiment uh, in the market, especially on the demand side. And, and that sort of coupled with a decline in, in COVID, which, uh, as you know, when COVID started, we were able to launch a new business unit to somewhat counter the negative impact on demand for accessories and, and audio products. Uh, but now in 2022, we had the negative impact on demand and then some sort of supply chain disruptions out of the, yes, uh, out of the Ukraine war. We had some impact of COVID in China on the supply chain. But then we, given sort of COVID globally was in decline that the health and wellness uh, business unit did not deliver the same result as they had done in, in 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> so all of these factors led to a, a super uh, challenging year for us and, and, and overall a poor result. If you look to the column to the right, you see our full year Figures and and please note that this is from continuing operations only. So we've carved out the um, discontinued from so the top uh, part of the PNL. But we managed a, a small growth, and and thus this is attributed to our own brands, uh, as you can tell, sort of a solid growth there of eleven percent. Uh, our margin uh, were also improved. And that is primarily a result of a sort of product and brand mix. So as soon as we sell less health and wellness products, uh, we improve our margin. And as well, if we sell on brands and grow on brands, that will impact the uh, the average blended gross margin of the group, which is sort of the result of a slight improvement in, in, uh, in our margin, uh, as well as sort of the small growth on the top line. That, however, was not sufficient to uh, yield a, a profitable uh, operated property, but a profit year and then a significant decline actually year over year on the <clears throat> EBITDA side. Please uh, note here that the negative impact from inventory write down, uh, inventory uh, evaluation, and, and inventory accrual had an impact of roughly 4 million, and that was primarily coming through in our uh, fourth quarter. But you can definitely see sort of one of the key challenges is, is big debt burden when uh, interest rates uh, started to climb this year. The impact on our interest cost uh, is quite significant. So we, we have a roughly 40% increase in our in interest expense as a result of those interest uh, rate increases throughout sort of the back end of the year. And unfortunately, this is only climbing, so we have to take action. So uh, our interest cost uh, went to 7 million euros on a fully burdened debt load of roughly 50 million. And, and you can just uh, picture that that's purely and completely unsustainable given sort of where our profitability and, and, and top line numbers uh, stand at. <clears throat> Another sort of uh, impact, which is what we started uh, communicating after our queue, Three last year that we are discontinuing our health and wellness business. So that's uh, so we're in, engaged in, in a dialogue there with potential buyers. Same on the licensing side, 
and we've already closed down Dotis, which was a, a digital native audio brand, and Grell has also been divested to our co-founder of that business, Axel Grell. So all in all, uh, a, a net loss of 19 million, which obviously is a, a complete disaster. Uh, uh, and as I said before, uh, absolutely unsustainable. Uh, on sort of the, if you try to sort of take some positive out of this, uh, first of all, a small growth out of own brands, uh, and, and own brands are, are now having, I would say, pretty good traction, especially in North America. And then more importantly, which is one of the key assets we own and will be one of the key assets allowing us to manage out of the challenge, challenging situation is our distribution business, where sort of we continue to have a pretty steady uh, top line and, and actually have maintained that uh, top line for the last <clears throat> three years during the difficult COVID time. Uh, and, and I would say strong uh, operating profit at the same time. And then this, as I said, uh, is a key asset for us to capitalize on, uh, to manage out of the uh, debt burden, as well as provide liquidity into the group. But we've already, we, we didn't wait for these uh, bad results. We've already started to take uh, several different actions across all of our business units uh, just to reduce our operating expenses and, and, and probably right size the organization given where we've seen a decline in our top line sales in the last couple of years. But this sort of overall uh, reduction in OPEX is, is roughly 11%, but uh, many of the uh, headcount we unfortunately had to uh, cut back on were uh, sort of had uh, resources in the top end of the, the pay scale. So the impact on our OPEX is greater than 11%, probably closer to 15%. And we are obviously looking now and analyzing and monitoring <clears throat> very closely whether we have to do anything further uh, in, in terms of headcount reduction. But uh, the way things stand now, we don't believe so as long as the markets uh, hold up uh, for us going forward. But this can give you an idea. So we, a year and a half ago, we had 27 people at the Urbanista and we have cut that more than 50% and, and the Urbanista managed to squeeze out uh, a small profit even last year after having um, had a negative uh, EBITDA of over 1 million euros for two consecutive years, 2020 and 2021. <clears throat> so good that Urbanista has turned the corner and we even uh, had a small growth year on year on, on top line. So that's, that's just an example of how we've sort of taken every single business unit within the organization and tried to sort of reduce uh, our costs and even on distribution <clears throat> which, as I said earlier, has been fairly stable. We decided to scale that back and prepare for a, a sort of slowdown or muted demand, uh, at least for the first half and, and probably leading into the second half of this year. Uh, it's sort of in line with expectation that the market will be challenging over the next few months, but will sort of the second half pick up again uh, uh, based on sort of various macro, hopefully, factors coming into play at that time. <clears throat> already talked about e-com uh, in previous presentations. So when COVID hit in 2020, we saw sort of a shift in uh, retail sales from retail traditional retail stores to e-com. And, and we tried to counter that by uh, entering into e-commerce ourselves. And in the last two years, two and a half years, we've uh, lost in excess of 6 million euros from that initiative, and, and we've now completely pulled back on that. Uh, we do operate brand sites of our own brands, but we're not actively uh, sort of reaching out to customers and try to convert them into transactions. So this is traffic generation is primarily driven by PR, and that's how we intend to do it going forward. We don't see <clears throat> the market changing anytime soon. We're, of course, uh, active on, on Amazon. This is a little bit uh, sort of easier account to manage from a profitability point of view, but of course you can also break your back in, in that channel if you're not cautious on your marketing spend. And uh, then, uh, of course, on one hand we've scaled back, but we've at the same time had to invest in areas where we believe there will be growth and profitability ahead going forward. One of the brands we own is, is Clicker, where we've uh, added the two uh, resources last year, and we're actually looking at adding more on the back of strong interest 
in North America, particularly in relation to the recent um, collaboration we announced with a brand called G4, which is a specialist in impact protection uh, for targeting sort of athletes. It's a well-known brand that has, <clears throat> has sort of strong uh, uh, affiliation with uh, U.S. athletes and, and U.S. sports teams. It's uh, G4 is owned by Ted Bowley, who, amongst others, is the owner of the Chelsea Football Club. So a, a well-known brand and a great sort of uh, agreement we reached with them. And wherever we presented the clicker G4 range for cases, which is also important to note, uh, sort of we're expanding clicker uh, sort of beyond the attachable category into cases. And, and the case category is is obviously probably 10 times, if, if not more, larger than the attachable category. So that's also a pretty important pivot for Clicker, the Clicker brand going forward. We've also invested in our, our US <coughs> or North America sales team, where we now have close to 20 people. And we've been present in, in North America for over 20 years. So that's where the company was actually founded. And, <coughs> and North America is a critical market for all of our brands going forward. Uh, we have now reached an, an agreement with more than 50,000 point of sales and, and, and America. It will be quite significant for us to conquer going forward for all the brands and sort of the, the turnaround story. So I'm <clears throat> already taking a lot of action, but we're continuously monitoring our, our OPEX levels relative to uh, our revenue and then margin just to ensure that we're profitable going forward. Coming back to <clears throat> sort of more the transactions we're working on to achieve the objectives uh, that you see at the bottom of the of the slide. <clears throat> so our interest bearing debt today is roughly 50 million euros. We intend to through these actions to reduce that by uh, roughly two thirds. So we plan to reduce that by 30 to actually 35 million euros in the next six months. And the inventory at the same time with the divestment of health and wellness and, and uh, TLF and some of the inventory activities and actions we're taking, we expect to reduce that by more than 15 million. <clears throat> and all of these will ultimately have a, a good improvement on our liquidity. Uh, so we've already communicated the discontinuing of the uh, lifestyle, telecom lifestyle fashion, which is our licensing entity, as well as our health and wellness uh, business unit. These transactions are ongoing, and we're still <coughs> optimistic that telecom lifestyle fashion will be completed now in Q1, and, and that health and wellness will be completed in Q2. Then the sort of new ones, which are here, <coughs> Mark, Mark, that's under evaluation. <coughs> Excuse me. Are here, Mark, that's under evaluation, are the <coughs> sale of our majority of the European distribution that is, is also not to remove these past evaluation phase. We're actually in dialogue with potential investor. But the same on the refi and clicker. These have all now been <coughs> moved from the evaluation state over to the implementation ex execution state and, and, and states. And we, we, we feel good that all of these transactions will be completed sort of within the given time frame uh, we've sort of uh, put forward. In uh, in the last uh, few weeks, and so so we're progressing in all of those. And again, these will uh, enable us to support uh, growth of our own brands going forward. You might ask then, sort of, what's going to be left of Strax when all of these transactions are completed? So first of all, Strax will move from being somewhat of a hybrid distributor and the brand owner into more of a pure house of brands or a brand owner. We will have four remaining brands, all of which we believe have sort of good upside potential, particularly urban as the clicker and planet buddies where we are <coughs> listed in, in several major retail accounts in, in North America and, and have good presence in, in, in certain regions in, in Europe as well. And then Australia is coming on pretty really strong and, and then Japan is also a significant market for all of these brands. So we will have these <coughs> four brands under the Strax umbrella, and then an ownership, a minority ownership in a European-based distribution company. This will this will not only sort of allow us to communicate easier to the uh, investment community, it will also allow us to <coughs> sort of fully separate the conflicts that often 
come up when you own brands and our distributor between distributed brands and, and then own brands. So we, we expect that once these are completed, we would have a obviously a much simpler organization, but, but everything sort of from a communication point of view and conflict of interest point of view will be sort of easier to address in this simplified structure. We're still bullish on the industry audio uh, being sort of the key driver of growth uh, through wireless headsets becoming more prevalent and, and, and strong growth expected out of that category still going forward. Uh, I think I've mentioned before the expectation in 2025, 2026, that roughly 650, 700 million units of true wireless products uh, will be sold uh, in each of those years. So significant growth to be had. Uh, we're, we're strong position there with, with um, Urbanista. Uh, the case category is also sort of a little bit attached to smartphone underlying growth in smartphones, which had plateaued in the last few years. But we always communicate that sort of at the same time, the smartphone new phones per year might be sort of plateauing. The overall installed base of potential customers is growing each year. So we estimate that roughly 7 billion, or five, sorry, excuse me, 5 billion consumers today have smartphones. And that's sort of growing by a few hundred million each year. Again, even though the smartphone market is not growing. And the other trend that's happening, which will sort of support growth in the uh, industry and in the categories we we play in, is average selling prices are going up, which are also driving driving uh, growth. And maybe the third factor here is people or consumers are actually buying more units per device. So it's not uncommon that you have but at least uh, one uh, sort of pair of headset, uh, you might have a couple of uh, couple of cases or buy two or three cases during the lifetime of your your smartphone because people are now holding on to their smartphones for 36 to 40 months versus five, six years ago, then the average time was probably 18 months. And, and maybe it's also uh, worth mentioning that another sort of factor driving growth is uh, most of the smartphone manufacturers or the brands are taking accessories out of the box. If you, again, go back a few years, most of them had a travel adapter. Now you only get a cable. Many of them had a headset, which has now been completely taken out of the box. So out of box aftermarket market is growing as a result of that as well. So a few underlying factors that still make us uh, relatively bullish on the product categories we engage in. Uh, quickly, just uh, uh, we've covered this uh, many times before that uh, we have a track record of, of uh, acquiring brands, growing them quite uh, fast, and, and then exiting them. And the team now behind uh, Clicker, for example, is exactly the same team that executed the Gear 4 story a few years ago for us. And, 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 uh, and again, it's not unrealistic that we will be able to do. Uh, this uh, sort of same growth story with um, Clicker as we did with Gear 4 a few years back. And then Urbanista is also extremely well positioned now with the, I would say, differentiated product on, on uh, the collaboration products we've launched with Exeger, the solar sustainable uh, charging products. Uh, and we have a few new ideas and, and products in the pipeline with them. That sort of allows uh, sort of to sort of events to gain a lot of attention and, and, and attraction in the market. And then the product portfolio behind sort of these hero solar power products is becoming quite strong. And we have a very interesting roadmap as well. So Urbanista can return. We were on a path with Urbanista sort of exponential growth path until COVID hit. And we are hopeful that uh, sort of we can, with a lapse of two years in between, that we can sort of go back uh, to executing the, the growth that we saw leading up to 2020 with Urbanista. And sort of this final slide, so I'm not going to dwell on this one. Everybody can read whilst we have the Q&A session. Presentation, Gudmundur. And I think we will focus on the four remaining brands. Uh, do you see any clear synergies between those brands? Let me just go back to the... Slide, if I can here, it seems to be a little stuck. There are uh, there are uh, synergies between Urbanistan and uh, here. 
there are synergies between Urbanista and uh, oh, oops, and so a bit of a lag here. There are synergies between Urbanista and Planet Buddies. Planet Buddies sort of <clears throat> has a pretty broad range, but the key products are headsets for children. And there we obviously have uh, uh, sort of synergies with Urbanista. Many of the initiatives then that we're driving on sustainability, uh, for example, sort of recycled plastic, uh, sort of recovery of, of um, uh, old disposed units. We're looking at uh, other, I would say, innovative ways to offset our full plastic footprint. So you have those synergies across all brands. And then if you look at sort of the case category, Clicker obviously pivoting into cases now and, and Richmond and Finns primarily being on protection. You see synergies there on cross utilization of, of tools, cross utilization of, of market data, et cetera. So there are synergies sort of amongst four brands. And then individually, if you classify them by product categories, or Planet Planet Bullets on one hand, and then Clicker and Richmond and Finns on the other. But it's also sort of the way we're structured. Don't forget that um, sort of as a group, and, and one might ask, how can you execute Clicker with four resources on board and expect to capture a sort of five, six X growth this year uh, with those four people? The, the key thing in our business model is that we have a back end support uh, on uh, sort of Strax Global Services. We have in Asia roughly 20 people that are supporting all of our brands. With, uh, with sort of factory selection, factory audits, uh, quality assurance, uh, quality control. Then also the finance and controlling functions are all carried out in a sort of shared services group supporting all the brands. So, so you, can, you also have that element that we can resource the brand themselves uh, sort of with less people because of the, of the sort of strong strikes back end uh, supporting all of the brands and the same can be said on the sales side. So we have a, a single sales organ organization in the US, which is comprised of roughly 20 people, as I said earlier. And, and that sales organization is focusing on all four brands, not only Urbanista or Clicker, but when they go into customer accounts, uh, they try to position all of Strax brands to that particular customer. Okay, and the last uh, short question, you had some uh, problems with the gross margins during 2022. Should we expect higher gross margins uh, in 2023 and 2024? Most, <clears throat> most definitely. And that will come from, uh, I'll try to be brief, that will come from, uh, as I said earlier, both a, a brand mix as well as a, a product mix. So when we sell less health and wellness products, which have a significantly lower margin than the, the, our own brands, obviously our margin will improve uh, proportionally. Same when we sell own brands versus um, distributed brands, we have significantly higher margin within the group. So with these, all of these changes we're executing now, health and wellness going out, uh, distribution going forward will be accounted for at equity. You should have then <clears throat> purely sales of own brands going forward, which will carry yeah much higher margin than we've sort of seen historically and even way higher than we had uh, pre-COVID. Thank you, Gudmundur, for a nice presentation and taking your time and do this presentation. If any of you uh, who are watching this have uh, any questions, feel free to contact me at uh, hugo.lijo at Thank you for watching. Thank you.